September 5th, 1931 is a date which will forever haunt Scottish football. It brought the death of one of the country's greatest exponents of the game and left the other man involved to endure what he would describe as seven years of joyless sport. John Murray Galloway McCallum Thompson was born in the family home at Balfour Street, Kirkcaldy, in the early hours of January 28, 1909. He was the youngest of the six children of John and Jean Thompson, who now had four sons and two daughters. Four months after John's birth, the Thompson family moved to Bow Hill, next to Carden Den, where John Senior found employment in the colliery. Initially, the Thompsons lived in Miner's Rose, squeezed into a tiny cottage owned by the Fife Coal Company, first on 14th Street and then 17th Street. John's dad worked his way up the pay scale at the colliery and was rewarded, at the age of 50, with the chance to rent number 23 Balgregi Park, a newly built semi-detached council house which still stands today, although now renumbered as 27. John attended Den End and then Ochter Derren School. Today, the latter lies partly demolished. It was just a short distance from the family home. Just a few short years later, the school playground would be used as a makeshift car park for mourners attending John's funeral. The Thompsons were ardent churchgoers and young John was a regular worshipper at the Church of Christ, a Protestant organisation situated on Orbank Road, Carden Den. This building also still stands now a Masonic Lodge. Even when John signed for Celtic, he would travel back to Fife to worship in Carden Den every Sunday. But football was always John's passion. His parents did try and get him interested in other pastimes, but to no avail. On one occasion, they bought young John a violin. He hid it in a tree and went to play football instead. John did flirt with other sports, notably tennis and snooker, and his friends recall him being excellent at both. John quickly became known in the neighbourhood for his cat-like agility as a goalkeeper. Playing football in the back garden at Balgregi Park, he would stand in front of the greenhouse and challenge friends to try and beat him with a shot. The consequences of him not saving it unthinkable. For a short time, John joined his dad working at the colliery. It appears that he worked a few hundred yards below the surface, uncoupling wagons which came up from the coal seam, in a role known as an on-cost worker. In any case, it was to be a very brief employment, as his football career would soon take off in spectacular fashion. John would never forget his mining experience, though. One man he got to know had to have a leg amputated following an accident. When John became famous, he would always bring his old friend a gift from Glasgow and slip him some money. Some of John's first experiences of team football came with the Bow Hill Bing Boys, described as a nondescript local combination whose ranks John Thompson adorned before his thoughts turned to serious football. In 1922, he started representing Ochterdern School, playing in goal. In 1924, he was part of a cup-winning team, keeping a clean sheet against Cowdenbeath higher grade. Upon leaving school, John briefly played for Bowhill Rovers before being spotted and signed by Methil side Wellesley Juniors in 1925. Wellesley's roots could be traced to a previous incarnation of the team founded by Irish Catholics and they played in green and white hoops just like Glasgow Celtic. The two teams were closely connected and in October 1926 Celtic scout Steve Callaghan attended a cup game John was playing in and afterwards set about signing the remarkable young goalkeeper. Legend has it that John signed the contract in Kirkcaldy on top of an outdoor fuse box On his way home to Carden Den, he was paid a £10 signing on fee. Just two weeks previously, John had turned down the offer of a contract from Wraith Rovers. Before appearing for Celtic, it seems John made a couple of appearances for Air United, under circumstances which today would be described as an emergency loan, as Air suffered from a shortage of goalkeepers after their number one was dismissed and handed a 14-day ban. A keeper by the name of Thompson is listed as their goalkeeper for two Alliance League fixtures and one of John's close friends remembered him playing for Ayr. It is, however, with Celtic that John will forever be associated. He was handed a surprise first-team debut by manager Willie Maley in an away game to Dundee on February 12, 1927. 
replacing regular keeper Peter Shevlin. John had just turned 18 a couple of weeks previously. Celtic won 2-1 and John would never lose his place in the team. Journalists were soon noting that the young keeper was particularly adept at catching high balls. One noted, barring accident, he will one day play for his country. During the time John played for Celtic, the team wasn't always particularly accomplished, although by the start of the 1931-32 season they had considerable talent and promise in their ranks. John's record of clean sheets is therefore all the more remarkable. In over 200 games played for Celtic, he prevented the opposition from scoring in a third of them. In 1927, and again in 1931, he earned a Scottish Cup winner's medal. John gained his first Scotland cap in an 8-2 victory over the Irish League team in October 1928. He was selected again for a game against the English League. The Scots lost by two goals to one, but John produced an extraordinary performance to keep the score down. He would go on to win eight Scotland caps in total. And so to September 5th, 1931, when a 22-year-old John prepared himself for another Glasgow derby against Rangers, which would take place at Ibrox Stadium in front of 80,000 supporters. The game kicked off at 3.15pm and the first half brought no goals. A photograph taken early in the second half shows John punching the ball away from young Northern Irish Rangers forward Sam English, who was just a few months older than his opponent in the Celtic goal. Moments later, the two men's lives would become entwined for eternity. A failed Celtic attack quickly turned into a desperate attempt to recover ground as Rangers went on the offensive. Jimmy Fleming threaded an inch-perfect pass through to English, who was bearing down on John's goal. As he had done so many times before, John went to meet the attacker. As English prepared to shoot, John started to dive at the striker's feet. English got his shot away and in his final act on earth, John's body deflected it wide of the post to prevent a goal. But there was a terrible price to pay. John's head came into violent contact with English's left knee, leaving the Celtic keeper prone and deeply unconscious with a grave head injury. English had been injured himself in the collision, but was quickly on his feet and running to John's aid. One look confirmed his worst fears and he frantically beckoned for medical assistance. John's head was heavily bandaged as he was borne from the pitch on a stretcher carried by members of the St Andrews Ambulance Association, having been tended to by medical staff from both teams. The game played out in a nil-nil draw, but no one was particularly interested. Everyone's thoughts lay with the 22-year-old goalkeeper lying in Glasgow's Victoria Infirmary. Doctors there realised there was little hope for John's survival, having suffered a depressed skull fracture. They did attempt an emergency operation, but John would never regain consciousness. Rangers organised a car to bring John's parents to his bedside, where his brother Jim and sweetheart Margaret already were, along with John's close friend, teammate and flatmate, Jimmy Maguire. Mercifully, John's parents made it to the infirmary, with minutes to spare. They arrived at 9.20pm and John passed away at 925 News of John's death quickly spread and it was a crestfallen Sam English who heard the news later that evening. Rumours would spread that John's fatal injury had been caused by a kick to the head. A photograph taken at the exact moment of the collision showed this to be completely untrue, but for English, the nightmare was just beginning. Taunts towards himself and his family became a regular occurrence, even when he moved to England to play. This would last for several years and eventually see him retire from the game that he loved, broken and disillusioned. In 1963, he visited John's brother in Carden Den, where the two men shared a quiet drink in the family home and reminisced. There was never any ill feeling from the Thompson family towards English. John's mother went as far as taking out an advert in several papers, stating that her son's death was an accident no one was to blame. Sam English died aged 58 of motor neuron disease 
the other victim of that September day at Ibrox, 36 years previously. John's funeral was arranged for September 9th, 1931, and his coffin lay in a front room of the family home beforehand, while the family allowed anyone who wished to come in and pay their respects. They came in their thousands. Tributes to John's brilliance poured in. Perhaps the real tragedy of his loss was eventually captured by the celebrated English commentator John Arlott. He was a great player who came to the game as a boy and left it as a boy. An estimated 40,000 people descended on Bowhill and Carden Den in the lead up to John's funeral. They walked and cycled from Glasgow, too poor to afford the train fare. They came from other parts of Scotland and camped out on the craigs, known locally as the crags, above the village, overlooking the Thompson family home and the cemetery. Floral tributes arrived at the railway station in their hundreds. One small artificial wreath from two little boys in Glasgow was placed upon John's coffin, along with one of his treasured Scotland caps. One neighbour spoke of John's kindness. Only the previous weekend he was here for a brief holiday, and when the ice cream trader came his round, he was treating all the bairns round the doors. 600 miners, due to work the back shift that day, chose to lose a day's pay rather than miss the funeral. The service was scheduled for three o'clock and the local schools arranged to keep the children indoors at that time. John was laid to rest in Bowhill Cemetery with representatives from every senior club in Scotland present. His coffin was carried by his Celtic teammates. Jimmy Maguire had stayed with the Thompson family for several days, helping as best he could. The forlorn figure of Sam English was there too with his head for the most part buried in a handkerchief. Soon, a century will have passed since John's death, yet he remains very much in the public consciousness, a unique talent to cross the religious and football divide in Glasgow, mourned by supporters of both Celtic and Rangers. His grave is visited regularly by fans from all over, itself an imposing monument paid for by public subscription. Every year, the John Thompson Memorial Football Tournament for Youngsters takes place in the village and a new generation are told about the brilliant young footballer who they could only dream of emulating. What John could have gone on to achieve is impossible to say, but he would almost certainly have been the Celtic in Scotland number one throughout the 30s. He will be remembered as a modest man with an extraordinary talent.